Good afternoon. We're excited you have joined us today. I'm Julie Woodward with the Oregon Forest Resources Institute, and I'm excited to be your host today for the True School Online webinar. Tree School Online is a production of the OSU Forestry and Natural Resources Extension Program and the Partnership for Forestry Education. We want to give special recognition to OFRI, who's helped lead this project, and to the U.S. Forest Service and the Oregon Department of Forestry for helping give us a grant to cover expenses. Uh, the Tree School Online webinars are scheduled every Tuesday from now until July 28th. We have two options a day one that starts at 10 o'clock and one that starts at three o'clock. Thanks for joining our afternoon one. A couple of housekeeping details before we get started with our great webinar today with Christine Buell. Uh, many of you probably are familiar now with Zoom, but just to make sure you know where that Zoom toolbar is, for most of you, it'll be on the bottom of your screen. If you um, roll over it, you'll see those button, buttons pop up. And um, some things on there we might use today, like if you have questions, there's a Q&A, and you're welcome to send us questions on that Q&A button, and we'll try and get to those at the middle and end of, of the webinar today. Um, also, your audio is muted, so that'll only be for the speakers today, as well as video, you'll only see those um, that are speaking. Uh, as Minton mentioned, we'd love to have any questions come in. There is also the chat button. We'd like to try and hold the chat just if you have a technical issue or you have something about the webinar, um, but any questions for our speaker, Christine, today, uh, we'd ask those go into the Q&A. Christine's also prepared some resources to go with her talk today, and those are available if you go back to where you registered in the Tree School Online Class Guide. You'll find uh, access to those on our instructor resources, and so you'll be able to go in there uh, under the webinar description and look for all those resources, and she'll mention some of those today too. Also, if there's any need for credits, if you're a um, professional logger or the OPA or other credits, those are also available in the instructor resources. Uh, the rec this webinar is gonna be recorded today. So if you'd like to go back and watch it again, it'll be available within a few weeks. It's archived on the website, on the Trees to Know website. It uh, comes out as a YouTube video. So if you missed something today, you're welcome to go back and watch that. Or if you love it, you can also suggest it uh, to others to watch. Um, we'll also have a couple polls today. Those should just pop up for you. There is a polls button that you can click if they don't, but one at the beginning and one at the end, just to help us know um, who we're who's out there listening today. And then also, if uh, at the end, if you want to give us some feedback, we'd love to get to get that. So with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Christine Buell. And Christine is a graduate of OSU, Oregon State University, and the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And she has served as an entomologist from everywhere from Hawaii to Lebanon uh, on projects spanning from public health to chemical ecology. She currently serves as the state forest entomologist with the Oregon Department of Forestry, where she provides statewide technical assistance to both private and public landowners and monitors forest health. Uh, and she goes out and does that via aerial and ground surveys. So Christine, welcome today. And do you wanna just give us a quick overview about what you're going to share? Sure, so today we're gonna to talk about a topic that um, might be a little surprising being that this is forestry. Um, we're gonna talk about bees that are in the landscape. Forests are a wonderful reservoir for bees. Um, so you might learn something new here. Um, or it might increase the knowledge that you already have about trying to enhance habitat for these very valuable creatures in our environment. Awesome, thank you. We appreciate you coming and spending your time with us and I'm looking forward to hearing more. We're gonna start with one of those polls. And so uh, on your screen, you're going to see it come up and it's just three questions. We're gonna ask, where are you from? If you can just give us your closest geography and then a little bit about yourself uh, if you were if you're a woodland owner or a professional or some other entity and then about how many acres of forest land you either own or manage or are part of and we appreciate you helping to to let us know how many people are out there today we have it looks like over 60 people have already joined for the webinar today and so uh, Christine has a lot of great information that helps people 
in all sorts of professions in the forest sector. So go ahead and just click on those three questions and we'll give you a, another minute to fill that out. So we appreciate everybody participating, had good turnout. Uh, where we see most of you are from are from the Willamette Valley, so about 77%. Uh, but we have people from all across Oregon, the coast, Southwest Oregon, Central and Southern. Uh, we have from Washington and then also uh, other parts of the US. So no one on this one from outside the US, uh, but glad for all of you that have joined from around Oregon and Washington and around the US. Uh, about yourself, we have, a, again, across the board, about half of the uh, folks are woodland owners. There's also professionals from all sorts of different entities. And it also looks like our um, forest land, do you own or manage, looks also like it's across the spectrum from owning uh, 10 acres or less to over a thousand acres with about 26% don't have any land that they own or manage, but the majority the other uh, people have across the, the broad from 10 acres up over a thousand. So thanks everybody for participating. And we uh, are excited to get started with Christine. So I'll invite her to come back and share with us, uh, see the forest for the bees. Okay, great, thanks Julie. Okay, so as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about bees in the forest. I might use pollinators and bees interchangeably. Primarily what we're talking about are bees. We do have other very important pollinators in the forest as well, but bees by far do the load of the work. So we are going to be focusing mainly on wild and native bees, but I will um, talk about honeybees and other managed bees as well. And I do wanna clarify what I mean when I say bees. Um, many of us that work in forestry are familiar with wasps that are found in the forest. And you probably have also heard about um, the murder hornet, which I will address, um, which is a true hornet. Um, but that is not what we're really gonna be diving into today. Um, there is a large taxonomic difference between wasps and hornets versus bees. Um, mainly in that bees provide um, essential services such as pollination that wasps and hornets don't aim to do. With that being said, they can carry pollen on their bodies. Some of them do visit plants as well. Um, but we are quite familiar with the yellow jackets and bald-faced hornets that we do see nesting around in our forested areas, but we are going to be focusing on bees. But since we are talking a little bit about wasp and hornets in the beginning here, I do want to address um, recent information about the giant Asian hornet, um, which has been called the murder hornet in media, um, a little bit of shock value there. Um, I want to give you the status update and also maybe dispel some fears that people might have about it. Um, so it was first identified in British Columbia and Canada. Um, it has since been found in Washington. It has not yet been found in Oregon. Um, it is Asian in origin, so it is not native. Um, it tends to prefer to nest in forested areas, and that can be problematic for um, some of our folks that we have that own forests or work in forests because they are ground nesting and they can have very large nests in that forested area, uh, but they are generally not very aggressive. They are very similar in a lot of our other ground nesting insects, such as our yellow jackets, um, that we do have aerial yellow jackets, but we have ground nesting yellow jackets that tend to be a bit more aggressive towards the end of summer and into fall. That's probably going to be the same with the hornet. Um, so watch where you step. If you see a, a large wasp looking creature, um, it's probably to get out of that area. Um, Singly, these insects um, uh, do have a large venom load, but really would take multiple stings for it to be impactful in a public health way. With that being said, some folks are more sensitive to certain venoms, so please take caution, but um, for the most part, these are um, not as aggressive if they don't have something to protect, such as a nest. They can be more damaging for honeybees, um, as is known, they do tend to congregate on honeybee nests um, and they can attack honeybees, but honeybees can protect themselves 
by basically covering the hornet with their bodies and vibrating very quickly, generating a little increase in heat, which can effectively cook the hornet out. So um, they are uh, adapted to protect themselves against these pests. So for any of you that don't know too much about bees, I'm gonna give you a very quick and dirty biology overview of bees. Um, some of you may have some beekeeping background, and so that's really gonna serve you in this talk. Um, but for others, I'll try and catch you up to speed. Um, so honeybees that we know the most about because they're so actively used, and especially in our agricultural systems, are actually non-native. The ones that we use are imported, um, we can rear from those populations here, but the species origin is not from the United States. Um, we do have some that escape their hives and become feral, so they can be wild as well as kind of domesticated, but they are not native. They are often used, obviously, to pollinate many of our crops. Um, the wild and the managed populations can also visit some of our non-crop plants. Um, so they do serve an essential pollination service, but because they do pollinate mainly the same types of crops that are from their origin being European, um, there are some crops that maybe they're not familiar with uh, pollinating or are just not able to pollinate. Um, and so we do have our wild bees to provide that service. And I'll get more into what I mean by that. Um, in terms of not being able to pollinate certain flowers because bees can be very specific. Um, so the majority of our wild bees, of which we have over 500 species, those numbers could be up in more closer to like eight or 900 because there are many that have not quite been taxonomically sorted. Um, the majority of these bees that are native to our area are social, um, or so, I'm sorry, they are solitary um, and not social. And we have these two different types of styles. So social means they basically work and live together, such as what you see with honeybees. Bumblebees are another group that do this. So you'll have a hive mentality. Everybody has a job and they're trying to support each other. Most of our wild bees are actually solitary. They do not support a hive. They lay their young and then they move on or they just die from there on. So that's the majority of our bees. They don't have that um, group work system. And with that being the case, mainly there's aggression shown when bees are trying to protect a hive. So they're protecting their young. But if you don't have a hive to protect, you just lay your eggs and move on, then you're generally not that aggressive. So we do see that with our wild bees, they don't tend to be very aggressive. Um, most of our wild bees are also solitary um, and ground nesting. So they can have large communal nests or they might nest in a solitary manner and sometimes in close proximity. So I kind of like to use the example that a lot of our wild bees that are solitary nesters live kind of like in condo units that maybe they all like the same area, but they are not living together. They are not working together. They have their individual units that just happen to be next to each other. The majority of our wild bees are ground nesting and solitary. Some also nest in cavities that include stem cavities, especially for pithy plants where they can mine out that stem cavity. Um, in rocks, um, in timber, we often see any sort of holes made by exiting large wood boring beetles, for example, are often utilized by these bees. And so there are many different types of life cycles depending upon um, how their bi biology works in that some bees may live for multiple years, some just live for one year. It might depend on their sex, uh, their species, uh, their part in the caste system, so basically what job they have to do. It really does depend on the situation. Generally, the way that our bees work is that with honeybees, because they're maintaining a hive, it's a little bit different than our wild bees. So in our wild bees, for example, bumblebees, the female queen will be fertilized and at the end of the season, she is the only one that survives. The rest of the colony dies, so that fertilized queen overwinters. The next year she lays those eggs and that starts the next colony. And that's the way that that one works. For a lot of our other um, wild bees, especially the ones that are solitary, they're not living in a, in a commune such as a bumblebee, um, they basically will either overwinter as um, different stages. So usually they start off as eggs and then developing into larva and pupa. 
and then they can overwinter at that stage and then emerge as adults of various sexes. They mate and start the process over again. So Oregon has a lot of diverse bees. Um, here's an image and I'll just let you feast your eyes on it a little bit. Um, that you can see all the different varieties that we have. There are a lot of colors, um, a lot of different hairs in different places, different antennae, uh, different jaw structures. Um, we have a lot of diversity in our bees. Like I said, we have over 500 known species of bees. So there's a lot of variety that's out there. Some of them are very beautiful and some of them don't look like bees at all. They may look like wasps. They may look like ants with wings. Um, there's a lot of variety there. And Oregon is a great place for bees, mainly because we not only have a lot of diversity in our crops, we have a lot of specialty crops. So earlier I had mentioned that honeybees pollinate a lot of our crops, um, but there are some crops they can't pollinate. So they do have a difficult time with like the legume family. So anything in the pea family sometimes has a, um, a snap mechanism on the flower and it's really hard to open that up because their body weight isn't enough to open um, the trapdoor lever of that, um, or they simply just cannot maneuver around that trapdoor. But bees such as bumblebees, a lot of our natives can actually access that trap and they can pollinate. And so we do have some specialist bees or some generalist bees, depending upon what kind of flowers they can access. The flower shape is very important and I'll talk more about that later on when I'm talking about what type of plants you wanna to plant to attract these insects. Um, but Oregon does have a lot of these specialty crops that are pollinated by a variety of different bees. To further support that argument, there was a study done looking at bumblebee species richness across the nation. Um, and what you're seeing here is a map showing that the states that, or the areas of the country um, that have green are generally lower in bumblebee species richness, but as you move towards yellow, orange, then to red, you have increased species richness. Now I will say the areas that are green are not devoid of bumblebees. It just means that perhaps they could have lower populations of bumblebees, or perhaps they just didn't collect enough data showing that. There are some areas that have worked a little bit harder in terms of trying to investigate bee populations. Luckily, Oregon is one of them, as is Washington. They're delving into this as well. So we're really looking into who's occurring where. But on this map, you can see that probably one of the richest places for bumblebee species is the Willamette Valley in Oregon. Um, the reason being is that we have that diversity of crops that I mentioned. And if you look in areas such as what we call the nation's bread basket in the Midwest, they have a lower species abundance of bumblebees. And this is primarily due to the fact that they grow a lot of monoculture crops. So if you don't have much food source of variability, that doesn't serve maybe some specialist pollinators that need a different type of plant to feed on or they're growing a lot of plants that are wind pollinated or pollinated in some other method other than by bees. Corn is a prime example of this. Corn is wind pollinated, is not visited by bees actively. Um, so you see these areas with large monocultures of corn not being very rich in bees. So where you have that um, richness, bees will visit. This is another example of why Oregon is a great place for bees. We also have some specialty pollinators. So in this example, you can see in this video, we have alkali bees. So remember I mentioned that honeybees are managed, meaning we keep them in a hive, we take care of a lot of their needs. Um, we also tell them what to do and where to go. Um, but we can also provide that for some of our wild bees. Mostly they're wild because they're just roaming feral. They nest where they want, they feed on what they want. But we can try and enhance habitat in certain areas to try and keep them in a spot to serve some of our needs and use them for these effective pollination services they provide. So Northeast Oregon is a really um, great example of this in which alkali bees are utilized to uh, pollinate the adjacent alfalfa field. So in this image, you're seeing what was created was um, a ground nesting site. And all they had to do was clear away the grasses and other plants that were present there because bees don't like to dig through that stuff as much. They have exposed soil that suits this specific type of bee, but they like this type of soil. They like the quality of the soil. They like that it's available. It's an open space and they will nest in that. Sometimes water is also provided so that they can uh, make mud tunnels or tubes down into their nests. 
Um, but basically that's all that's done. Once you build the space, they will come and then they pollinate these adjacent um, alfalfa fields. And sometimes a year they're actively flying and you might drive through an area where, where you'll see a sign such as the one in the top right saying to slow down because they don't want a whole bunch of road kills of bees that are crossing the road from one spot to another. So the reason I bring this to you today is because forests are also a really great place for bees. And this is really interesting new information that has been recently discovered. Um, previous to this, a lot of the research on where bees are occurring or what service they're providing in forest systems was in tropical systems where there are a lot more trees and understory plants that are pollinated um, by these bees and utilized to produce certain crops out of those forests. In our boreal forests and our temperate forests, um, we didn't really think about bees because we don't have a lot of flowering trees and plants that require pollination. Now, with that being said, that doesn't mean that these bees aren't still visiting those plants. Um, even if they are wind pollinated, sometimes bees will still visit even a conifer, and I'll explain that shortly. Um, but there are other resources that are being utilized in the forest system. If they're not just looking for things to eat, they're also looking for places to nest. And that is a key component on why forests are so important because they are providing this huge reservoir of nesting opportunity for these bees. And then from there on, those bees that might nest in the forest could then visit adjacent areas that might provide flowering resources for feeding. So as I mentioned, forests can be great and often overlooked habitat for foraging plants. So those plants could be anything in the understory, even in a closed canopy, shaded system. I challenge you to go into any forest during spring and summer and just stand by a plant that's flowering. Sometimes they're very tiny and just wait by them a little while and chances are you'll probably see a fly or a bee visiting them for pollination services. Um, but almost more importantly, there's also bare soil for ground nesting um, and for hibernation. Remember I mentioned that bumblebee queens need to hibernate somewhere. They often burrow into um, the soil, sometimes using old rat burrows or other holes made in the ground by vertebrates. We also have a lot of debris. So we have stumps that have holes in them. Um, we have pithy stems of plants that they can nest in as well. And we have a lot of forage plants that are also very important um, in the forage system, forest system, whether you're talking about the um, more drier habitats that you'll find in Central Oregon or South uh, Western Oregon or the moist habitats along the coast or some of the higher elevation alpine habitats. In all these habitats, we do have forage plants that these can visit. This includes the rhododendron and salal, Oregon grape, um, current salmonberry, madrone, cyanothus, there's a wealth of plants that provide these services. These will also visit maples. Um, that's one of our few trees that they are actually visiting for nectar and pollen. And they're a really important resource because maple, um, like you might see the vine maple in our forest, often blooms before anything else. So that's a really important early season nectar source for these bees to visit and collect from. Bees have also been found on conifers, even though conifers are wind pollinated, um, they will visit them to collect resins um, to line their nests. So they can be important as well. They don't tend to collect pollen, although they have been shown to do that here and there. We don't know if that's just happenstance they're passing through or that's their um, only opportunity to collect pollen because nothing else has pollen in the immediate area. Um, but the pollen of conifers is generally a low protein source, so it's not ideal, but that pollen has been found on their bodies as well. And as I mentioned, there are a lot of different nesting opportunities in forests. Um, depending upon the species, these insects can nest in virtually anywhere on the ground where there's a bit of exposed soil. They can nest in between rock piles. Um, oftentimes, if you'll see hard packed soil, um, you know, along a, a roadside, for example, look a little bit closer, you might see some perfectly little round holes. And if you wait long enough at the right time of year, you might see a head poking out. So um, they're present even in areas where it looks like there's devoid of anything else. Um, they're also utilizing wood cavities for the most part. In these wood cavities, they are using pre-existing holes to make their nests, um, but some may chew through, such as the carpenter bees. Um, they have the ability to chew their own holes. 
So pollinators can also be found in addition to in our um, less strongly managed forests, also in our more strongly managed forests. So just because we, the objective is timber production in some of these areas, it doesn't mean it's not still a great place for pollinators. We still have those ground nesting opportunities or nesting in stumps and woody materials. Um, we also still have forage plants that spring up this could be adjacent to the forest or along roadsides or sometimes within the forest itself before the canopy closes. Additionally, whenever we create a slash pile that we burn, you have an open source of ground nesting. I've seen a lot of bees utilize that for ground nesting. Um, that can also be seeded in with some understory forbs that wouldn't compete the seedlings that go into the uh, surrounding area. So there are ways that we can manage both objectives for tree timber harvest as well as for pollinators either within or alongside the stand. And Oregon has a lot of forest habitat as we are all aware. So knowing that this is a great reservoir for bee habitat, we have the perfect opportunity to try and increase our knowledge of what bees require what in these forests and where they occur so that we can try and um, promote that and possibly create more uh, habitat corridors for them in some areas where it's a bit more fragmented. So as I'm sure many of you are aware, um, bees have faced a lot of risks in the past, a lot of die-offs um, that you've probably read about or heard about in the news. Colony collapse disorder in honeybees is still an ongoing issue. Um, it hasn't been as extensive as when it was first identified. It was pretty catastrophic. Um, while we still don't have one silver bullet, it may not be one issue that's causing that. Um, we are aware that the loss of habitat, um, pesticide application, et cetera, is having an impact on honeybees in addition to diseases, mites, et cetera, that are attacking hives. So there, there are a lot of things that collectively could cause dieback, um, but we don't have a, um, a perfect solution for that. It's a work in progress but we are trying to reduce some of those uh, risks to honeybees. In addition to honeybees, native bees have been shown to be in decline in a lot of areas, and there have been massive die-offs, such as um, many of you uh, remember in the Wilsonville Target parking lot some years back, some bumblebees faced a mass die-off when um, linden trees were treated for another insect, aphids, that were um, creating a sticky residue from that tree that gets on windshields. So the trees were treated for the aphid, not realizing it would impact the bumblebees as well. And so there was a large dieback there. So because of these things that have occurred, um, federally there have been a few plans put in place to try and um, enhance, promote, and protect pollinators and their habitat. Um, primarily money has gone to trying to enhance habitat increase education, and also increase the dialogue between different um, public agencies, so state, local, federal government agencies with growers, uh, with the general public to increase education, to try and increase um, the ability for habitat to be created in all these different areas. Sometimes that's through uh, financial payments to try and promote more habitat en enhancement. Sometimes it's just education. Um, another huge piece of this is educating pesticide applicators on reading labels and actually having labels for them that indicate that there's some damage or toxicity possibility for bees um, because that wasn't really clearly spelled out sometimes on some labels. Um, we still have a long way to go. There's still a lot we don't know. There are secondary products, inert ingredients. Um, some things like inerts don't need to be listed on the label. And so you may not see things on there um, that we know can be toxic to bees, or maybe they haven't been tested um, for their toxicity to bees. So that we still have a long way to go there. Um, but providing the framework for people at least identify what products are toxic to bees and how to better utilize other products um, to not come into contact with bees is really important. So education is really key in all of these efforts. So from those um, rulings, we've also had uh, a lot of work that took place right after in 2015 with the uh, uh, Federal Strategic Plan for Pollinators that was put into place. Oregon shortly followed with our own practices. 
And mainly what we did was put together, um, oh, sorry, I don't wanna go into question break just yet. Um, mainly what we put together was the Oregon Bee Project, which I'll get into after the question break, but it's Oregon's attempt to try to enhance bee habitat and health in any way that we can. And a large platform is education, such as what I'm doing today. So with that, um, let's have a question break. Great, good information, Christine. So kind of back from one of your very first slides, someone asked, um, so what kind of insects pollinated before the advent of the imported honeybees? So it depends on how far back you wanna go. Um, but the short answer is we have a lot of wild bees that are pollinating. Um, we have them here still. They were here before the honeybee. They will be here after the honeybee. Um, bumblebees are a huge one that you're all familiar with. Mason bees, any sort of bee that you would think about that you wanna invite into your garden. Those are bees that were there. They will continue to be here. Sweat bees, um, we have a great variety in terms of a lot of specialists that only focus on some plants and some generalists that focus on a lot more plants at a time. Um, if you wanna go even further back, um, we do have some fossil records that we had our own species of apis, which is the genus of honeybees, um, way back in the day in North America. But then um, uh, I believe they had died out or something occurred in which we no longer had a native species here. But long, long time ago, we did have a pollinating apis genus in North America. Interesting. So we have two questions that are kind of along the same lines and they're asking, are those yellow jacket traps or the non-toxic traps truly safe for beneficial bees? Yeah, generally they tend to be because the attractants in those traps for wasps um, are targeting very specifically wasps. And some of them, you need to read the labels because they will specify, good ones will specify what species of wasps they're trying to attract some wasps tend to like more sweet things, some like uh, more carb-rich things, um, more meaty or oil-based products. Some will go for either. So it can be very specific on even which wasp species it can attract. Um, you will still find the bees here and there in those traps, but generally they aren't as attracted to those things. And visually, they're not attracted to that type of bag, no matter how it smells. So. Um, but I will tell you a very important uh, trick to using those wasp uh, traps. And remember, wasps are a very important part of our environment as well. They are great natural predators. They eat things like cutworms in your garden, for example. So they eat a lot of pests. They also break down um, roadkill we have on the roadsides. They do a lot that we're probably forgetting. But in areas where you don't want them to occur, it's most effective to set out those traps in very, very early spring. And I'm talking beginning of March, for example, sometimes end of February, if we're having a very warm early spring because then you take out the queens of the yellow jackets and, and they overwinter just as the bumblebees do as fertilized queens to start the next colony. If you take out those fertilized queens, you've knocked out a single colony with each queen. So that can be very important to knock down populations in your immediate area for that year and for subsequent years. Great, good suggestions. Um, just maybe two more. Why don't we hear more about mason bees since they are supposed to be more productive pollinator? Um, I feel like I hear the most about mason bees in addition to bumblebees. It could be that maybe they're not the cute fuzzy bee like bumblebees and they get overlooked. I think in, in gardener circles, mason bees are a hot topic because you can purchase them or just host them in those bee boxes um, and try and keep them on your property. Um, but that is definitely a bee that is part of this focus that we have a lot of wild ones. Be aware that there are also exotic mason bees that can be imported to different states. Um, so it's very important to ask what species of mason bee that you are buying if you are purchasing these bees. Because um, we do want to try and keep it native, but with that being said, what's most important is phytosanitary conditions. So it's not just the the, the bee being native, it's are there mites occurring on this bee, even if it is native, but it's being reared in a facility where it could have brought something in. So very important to make sure you're getting clean bees. Good questions to ask. And then uh, the last one before we let you continue on, is, are all the insects on your question break page bees? Are all the insects 
on on their bees. Yes, they are bees. All right. So and go ahead. One little follow up to that. Um, it's often easy to confuse bees with flies, especially since we have some bee mimics that are flies. So if you can look closely enough, um, bees have two pairs of wings, flies only have one. So that can be one trick. Another is that flies often have very short antennae and bees have longer antennae. So that can be a tip off as well. Um, but sometimes you have to look very close. Great. Well, I look forward to learning more about them and about the Oregon Bee Project. So we have some more questions coming in, but we'll wait and have those at the end of your um, presentation. Okay, great. Thanks. So um, we left off with um, federally, there were some things being done to try and enhance bee health and habitat. This includes honeybees. This also can include other pollinators, um, mainly monarchs, for example. Um, but Oregon is really targeting bees and especially our wild bees because we know we have such community richness in those bees and we want to promote that even further. So in 2015, we had legislative bills to provide funding for bee health and habitat enhancement, which is novel because oftentimes we'll have legislation that will ask us to do something, but then not provide any money or limited monies. Um, but this one was a good kickstart to um, forming the Oregon Bee Project, which currently is run by the Oregon State University, Oregon Department of Agriculture and Forestry. Um, and we have a variety of partners in the public and private realm to try and guide us in our direction. Um, but we are tasked in trying to enhance health and habitat of bees, whether that's by supporting research, reaching out to landowners for getting projects on the ground done, providing education and training, especially when uh, we're talking about pesticide application. Um, those are very essential pieces of trying to promote bees. As a part of the Oregon Bee Project, there's also the Oregon Bee Atlas. And the aim of this is that it's mainly a citizen science project, but all are welcome to collect this data. But it's a way to try and document the bee populations that occur in our state. So what bees occur where, in what richness. Um, when we know that, we can learn more about, uh, if we don't already know it, a little bit about their biology and then we can better suit guidelines for bees of certain areas. Some bees are very specific in their needs. You can't just throw out a handful of flowering plant seeds and expect that bees are gonna do very well. Um, sometimes you need to be a bit more specific than that. So this effort is a very important and more on that at the end of this talk. Um, there is also great research coming out of Oregon State University on bees and managed forests. Um, I'll give you just a, a, a little bite of what they have found in general. Um, anytime there is a large wildfire or um, heavy duty um, management, such as even a clear cut, um, they found that there's actually an increase in bee abundance and species richness right after. And that's mainly because you've opened up the habitat. So it's less shaded. So therefore you have a flush of flowering plants bees will come to that resource and utilize it. You also have open ground space for nesting and you often have residues such as left behind of course woody debris, stumps, etc. that have holes for nesting. So it's a great um, immediate resource that can last for several years thereon. After that when you have a closed canopy you still have great bee resources. It just changes a little bit in what they provide in terms of maybe only shade tolerant plants are present and um, the bees that pollinate those plants are then going to be visiting. So there is a lot of uh, dynamic change in populations of bees. Um, lastly, we also have a forest pollinator technical working group made up of a lot of different entities. Um, OSU, um, Forestry Extension is involved, the Forest Service, um, Xerces Society, Oregon Department of Forestry. And what we're doing is we're all communicating on what are our research questions? What resources do you have to tackle them? Do you have funding? Do you have manpower? Um, do you want to collaborate? And then we're actually tackling these projects. Um, we connect with landowners. We connect with anybody that's interested in working with us to try and enhance habitat, try to research what bees are occurring where. And this is all in an effort to try and increase what we can put out as guidance for people of the general public 
for timber owners on how they can enhance um, bee populations on their site. So a little bit more about the Oregon Bee Project, and there is a website you can visit that has a lot more information, but I'm just gonna give you a little bite here. So the mission is to bring all Oregonians together. We're reaching out to everybody. That's specialists, that's um, general, general members of the public, um, people in, involved in any sort of ecological expertise, um, anybody that's interested, we're trying to get them involved. Um, in, in this strategy to protect and promote wild and managed bees. Education, like I said, is the platform of everything that once people know a little bit more, it, it um, increases interest, but also it gets us a little bit further in what we're actually doing on the ground. We're also trying to produce uh, pollinator friendly practices that's putting out guidance on properties um, and trainings for pesticide applicators and then conducting research. And so these are a few arms of the Oregon Bee Project. Um, so the Oregon Bee Project is basically umbrella overarching all of these different opportunities. We have flagship farms, so trying to enhance habitat on farms, um, getting community engagement. We do a lot of tabling at different uh, community events and a lot of trainings for the general public as well as for specialists. We do pesticide applicator training to enhance understanding and awareness of how best to apply pesticides and what pesticides to utilize to avoid bee toxicity. As I mentioned, we have the Bee Atlas, um, which is a volunteer effort to try and capture the population data of bees across the state. And then diagnostics and research, a lot of this is centering around honeybees actually, and some of it spills over into wild bees as well, trying to understand ways to improve their health. So here's some of the outcomes we've had so far. We've been going since 2015, um, and these numbers are a little lower than uh, what they should be up to date because they are always changing as we're always doing things. So we have uh, 12 flagship farms that have added 50 acres of forage and 50 acres of habitat um, in addition to their normal crop load engagement. We've reached out to at least 18,000 Oregonians at different statewide training events. Uh, we have trained over 5,000 pesticide applicators and produced several publications on how to um, apply pesticides without introducing toxicity to bees. There's also a app that I'm going to show you that makes it a lot easier where you just punch in the active ingredient of the product you're using and it will tell you what toxicity level it has for the bees. Um, makes it a little bit easier to find it than um, scanning through the label. Um, and then the Oregon Bee Atlas has trained over 150 citizen scientists, always looking for more. And um, our researchers have examined uh, bee health in many different types of ecological situations. That could be areas that are in agriculture, urban areas, forested areas, um, in trying to understand bee health and how to enhance it. So what can you do? So, we're going to talk about how you can enhance bee habitat on your property directly, whether it's you're just talking about your backyard garden or you're talking about a large forested system. These principles are very basic and they can be applied broadly. For more specifics, some of it, the research just isn't there, such as what are the best plants that I want to plant in my forested habitat? Well, that really depends on what forested habitat you're talking about. So we are trying to develop those things, but we do have general guidelines that um, are going to get you started um, and off and running. Um, you can also avoid bee toxicity from pesticide application. One example I like to use in how it's easy for us to forget about things like bees that could come into contact with pesticides is you may have seen the rhododendrons and azaleas that have been looking kind of poorly in the past few years. Um, there is an azalea lace bug, which is exotic, that was introduced, that basically settles down on a leaf and it sucks the nutrients out of the leaf and turns it a bit mottled yellow. It looks pretty bad. It never greens back up. So um, gardeners don't like the look of that on their azaleas and sometimes on their rhododendrons. And so um, there are very effective systemic pesticides that are applied as soil drenches that are uptaken by the plant and they travel throughout the plant and they kill the insect that's feeding on them. However, these soil drenches often will include a pesticide that is very toxic to bees. Um, and so what happens is, yes, you have killed the pest that's attacking your bush, but then that pesticide doesn't stop at just the leaf. It also can continue on into the nectar and the pollen. 
And in azaleas and rhododendrons in particular, it's been found that they are very effective at translocating this product throughout their materials to the nectar, and they can therefore um, affect bees. And azaleas and rhododendrons, if you've ever looked at one, you've probably seen a bumblebee visiting. And so bumblebees actively visit these plants. And so they can come into contact with these poisons, and that's maybe not something you might think about. Um, another example I like to use is that sometimes we like to apply pesticides on dandelions in our yard because they're unsightly. Um, while that may be the case, um, they are also heavily visited by pollinators and that's something that we tend to forget. Um, the last thing that you can do is you can join the Oregon Bee Atlas as a volunteer and I'm going to have all these resources for you at the end. It's also in the um, resources listed online. And when I say join as a volunteer, you can also submit your property so that that could be sampled on by other volunteers if you don't have the time or ability to be a volunteer yourself. So um, these are very general guidelines on how to enhance habitat. Like I mentioned, there's ongoing research on how to figure out to make these more specific to different regions of the, regions of the state. Um, we wanna make sure that all the work that we're doing is actually beneficial for pollinators and not just a feel-good thing for ourselves that isn't really serving them to their full extent. If we're going to do the work, we want to um, get the reward out of all that work and all the money that we're putting on the ground. Um, so very importantly, grouping plants with a similar flower shape provides a really strong signal for bees. So um, you may have heard that uh, white, yellow, blue, purple flowers are most attractive to bees. While that is true, they do like flowers of that spectrum. They will come to other, other color flowers, so that are on the opposite end. They will go to red flowers, for example, um, and pink flowers. But what's really important for the attraction is the shape of the flower. So bees have different tongue lengths. Some are very short, some are very long. And so that dictates what type of flower they can actually visit and collect nectar from. If there's a tube-like flower, it's going to be visited by a long-tongued bee. If it's a flat disc-like flower, like a dandelion or sunflower, it's probably going to be visited by a short-tongued bee. Um, there are also some flowers, as I mentioned, that have um, kind of a snap. Think of like a snapdragon, for example, or any of the pea plants. That can be hard for some bees to access. And so those different shapes are very important but if you clump those flowers by shape, um, then you provide less work for the bees to travel from flower to flower. They like to hone in on a certain flower of interest and then visit the next flower that's the same type. So they use the same strategy over and over again. So as they're flying by, they can see a whole bunch of flowers with the same shape. They're attracted to that. They zero in on it. And then they'll hang around in that area because they like the shape of that flower. So clumping those are really important. Um, in addition, it's really important to create a larger swatch of plants for bees to visit rather than dispersed patches. Don't make them fly far to get to their food sources. If you have separate patches, um, if there's some sort of corridor trail leading them from one to the other, that's very helpful. Um, and you want to uh, plant native plants. That's really important as much as possible, not invasives. Um, and create a flowering window that is of long duration. So that could be planting flowers that have long blooming windows such as yarrow, where they'll produce lots of flowers and they can bloom for a very long period of time. Or you want to intermix um, some early bloomers, mid bloomers and late season bloomers. So you have a long flowering window that can serve bees that might emerge earlier versus later. Not all bees are present at the same time. That's one thing that bees are very interesting and in that their populations are mobile and dynamic. Now, larger bees can travel much further than smaller bees, but they generally um, will be moving to different areas based on what resources are available. So if you stand in the same spot year after year in the same conditions, you likely will not see the same complex of bees. You might see some return visitors, but um, they're notoriously dynamic. And you wanna create habitat in forgotten areas, perhaps. It doesn't need to be in the prime spot of your yard. Bees don't care, they just want that habitat to be somewhere. So that could be even, especially in forested systems along roadsides or embankments, um, under fence lines. Um, I don't think I listed it in here, but any sort of old skid trails or landings where that ground is really compacted and planted trees generally don't do that great. Um, bees will do well there for nesting or if you are actually putting in plants. So um, those smaller rooted plants actually tend to do better in some of that compacted soil than do trees. 
And in addition, a lot of bees really like compacted soil for nesting. Some of them like looser soil that's mounded up, um, but a lot like the really hard packed soil that might not be good for anything else. Um, leave some areas with exposed soil, um, but also leave a little bit of a mess in your property as long as it's not a wildfire risk. Um, and I will caution, uh, we are not advocating for you to leave pine slash behind, for example, because there are bark beetles that can get into that pine slash and create a problem. Um, but leaving some pithy stem materials here and there, bees are going to thank you for that. They will use those resources. Don't feel the need to sanitize a site or um, by removing all those materials or getting rid of any exposed soil and putting plants in every piece because bees will also use that exposed soil. As I mentioned, they don't like to dig through dust that much. Um, also, very importantly, remove aggressive or invasive plants. Now, this could be um, native plants that very aggressively move through areas. Um, lupin is a great plant, for example. Um, we have native varieties that serve bees very well, but they serve specific types of bees because they are hard to open. They are in the um, pea family, I believe. Um, and th they tend to spread out and cover anything below them. So plants like that that are native, maybe put them in a few locations, um, realizing that they will spread. Whenever you have a reduction in food sources, you're gonna have a reduction in species richness of bees as we saw in that map that I showed you earlier. Now for pesticide application is very important to always read the label. The label is the law. You should, it, it can be dry material, but you gotta read the whole thing to protect yourself, but also protect your habitat. Sometimes reading all that material, it can be hard to identify what they're really saying about toxicity to bees, um, but there is a really great resource that was created by OSU. This is both a PDF and it is also an app. And what you can do is very easily just plug in the active ingredient into uh, this app or search for it in the PDF and it will tell you the toxicity of that product to make it, it makes it a little bit easier. And when you are applying pesticide, um, the best rule of thumb is don't apply pesticides before or during bloom periods, if at all possible. Whenever bees are flying and active, they're gonna be visiting plants and they can come into contact with those materials. Um, even if the window of exposure has passed, sometimes some materials will uh, have a longer residence time due to certain conditions, so be aware of that. There can be direct exposure that connects it with bees, um, you just sprayed a, a leaf, for example, it's so wet, the bees could land on it. Um, there's contact toxicity there. Um, they may be interacting with water that's contaminated. So especially ephemeral sources of water and tire tracks, for example, or on equipment, bees are visiting that to drink, but also to use for their nests. If there's any sort of drift into um, those water sources, bees can come into contact with that material an easy way to guide them away from that is providing, for example, um, a dish that has stones or marbles for landing pads and filling it with water that's clean. So um, they will be attracted to go there for water rather than these other sources that might be closer to pesticide intersection. Um, they can also uh, come to contact with pesticides through um, absorption from pollen um, or nectar or just carrying that pollen back to their nest if that product can travel through the plant, this could be through um, injection pesticides or soil drenches in which the plant is taking up that material. We don't have a lot of data on how well plants can translocate that material or how quickly. It really varies not only by the plant type, but also by the conditions. Um, for example, if we have a very wet season, that plant is actively moving moisture through the plant. Therefore, it's actively moving that pesticide even more quickly than we might assume. Um, there can also be drift on exposed soil um, that they are nesting on. So there are a lot of different ways that bees and their young can come into contact. So just be aware of that. If at all possible, trying to treat um, during times of the year when um, plants are not flowering or well before the time or well after the time that they have finished flowering, that can be very helpful. If you suspect any sort of bee toxicity, um, if you see a large number of bees dead in the ground, we definitely want you to report it. If there are any other kind of suspicious activities um, with bees, please do notify PARC. 
Um, and now you can easily reach them 24 hours a day by just dialing 211 and reporting that, that gets transferred over to PARC um, and they will investigate the issue. Next, I'm going to be talking about the Oregon Bee Atlas, and this is the citizen science effort to collect information on bee population data and species richness. And that data is being housed at OSU, so it can be used widely by any researcher, even if you're out of state, out of country. This is going to be a resource in which we want to connect what everybody is doing already to um, study bees. So we're asking for that data to be inserted here, and we're also combining it with the citizen science effort. So what this entails um, are volunteers that are trained um, and the level of training depends on what you want. Um, some of them just go out at collection events and um, will collect some bees. Some take it a step further and can identify the bees, um, but uh, and some lead groups out on these collection events. So the levels of participation really depend on what your time constraints are, ability to travel and your interest. But we have people across the state that have joined um, and it's gaining momentum year after year. I always like to say that um, bees are cute and fuzzy and people like to investigate those, but if this was a collection of spiders, um, nobody would really be that interested. So um, it's kind of nice working with something that's cute, fuzzy, um, you know, not, not too damaging uh, in terms of getting attacked. Uh, so we have a lot of um, uh, people that have been very interested in this effort. So these are the different teams for the Oregon Bee Atlas that we have formed and we do have a leader in each one of these regions that coordinates um, all of the uh, collection events that take place. And these are expanding all the time, as I mentioned. So in 2018, there were 558 locations just from the Oregon Bee Atlas volunteers. Um, that was more than doubled in 2019. And the specimens were 12,000 collected in 2018 was more than doubled in 2019 as well. So like I said, it's gaining momentum. People are having fun out there. Um, it's kind of like when you're a kid and you're looking for Easter eggs, you're, instead you're looking for bees. It could be very exciting. A lot of this is because we can find bees um, that are special. So we find a lot of the same bees over and over again, which is good. We wanna see large, healthy population numbers of those species. But we also find some specialty bees in which they're, con um, they're species of concern, they might be new state records. We didn't know that they occurred in the state before. They haven't been collected in a very long time. They're rare. Um, so that can be very exciting as well. Sometimes there's a little bit of competition amongst Atlas volunteers on who is finding some of these gold eggs. So as I mentioned, we want you to get involved. Um, one way you can do it is the Oregon Bee Atlas, as I mentioned, so I put a link there, but if you just look on the Oregon Bee Project website, um, you can uh, find that within there as well. You can also allow sampling on your property and you can be a part of that sampling or you can just allow people to come on your property on dates that you specify and times that you specify um, to sample the bees that, that um, you might have present. Um, and there's also a, a program um, in addition to master gardeners, master woodland managers, we have the pollinator steward program um, training people up on how to enhance habitat. You can then train other people on how to do that. So we do have a new guidance publication fresh off the presses. There's a lot more um, guidance that we need to develop that's more specific, as I mentioned, to different situations. Um, and this is a first step towards that, that we don't really have a whole lot out there for forests, especially temperate forests. And so we do have a publication out that gives you more detail than I provided today um, on basic bee biology. Um, and a little bit more about guidance for habitats. Um, there are some plant species listings, a little bit more information about specific bee groups. Um, so check that out, that is available now online. Um, in addition, um, for any of you that do own forest lands um, that are harvesting timber, um, we do have the Wildlife Food Plot Program. Now this is still in early development. We have not determined what those guidelines are going to be on how to assess um, and give you direction on um, how to enhance pollinator habitat. But basically what this is, is the Forest Practices Act allows us now to uh, dedicate a very small portion of forest land that um, cannot be utilized in commercial timber, but perhaps it can be utilized for wildlife um, food sources. Oftentimes the focus was for 
deer or elk, um, for example. Um, but uh, insects are also animals. And so um, new guidance is forthcoming for how to enhance this small portion of habitat for pollinators as well. Um, what this does is you can still keep that area zoned as timber, even if you cannot um, conduct active timber management on those lands. It could be a situation, for example, where the habitat has changed so dramatically, it cannot support any of our timber species, but it may be um, possible to support animal species. And bees are a big one. Bees are not picky. Um, they can be supported in a lot of different habitats, even if they don't look like they support much to us. So we just missed it, but Pollinator Week was last week. Luckily, um, it happens every year. There are events statewide. Um, around the Portland area, there are obviously a lot more events than some of the rural areas, but even east of the Cascades, we have a lot of events. So stay tuned for um, next year um, uh, when this occurs. It's usually the very end of June. A um, lot of different events that you can get involved in or just go and visit and you can learn a lot more. And I definitely encourage you to look at the Oregon Bee Project website. Um, there's a lot more information there, uh, more than what I covered today, always new information coming out. Um, there is also a podcast link there and a blog so that you can follow a lot of new developing information that comes about. And that's all I've got for you. We ran really short, um, but I want to make sure that we have a lot of time for questions. So uh, let's go ahead and open it up. Great. Awesome information today. A lot has happened in the last few years with the focus on um, pollinators. So it's great to get an update on all that. So the first question um, goes back to when you were talking about the forest and the bees. And are there some forest bees that nest in closed canopy forests and are shady areas? Are they mostly in open areas with sun exposure? That's a great question. So um, I'm gonna tackle this in the reverse. So um, a sun exposed area is also really great for ground nests because it provides um, a higher thermal uh, temperature for the soil nest because they do need some sunlight or some type of warmth because they are cold blooded. With that being said though, a lot of them do prefer to nest in shaded forested areas only for the reason that it's shaded out. There aren't a lot of plants competing in the understory, so you do have access to more exposed soil. So you will find um, ground nesting in a closed canopy, sometimes even in a very dark old growth forest. Bumblebees are notorious. There are a lot of species, not all, but a lot of species of bumblebees that will nest or overwinter in those darker closed canopy forests. Um, there are ways that they can um, increase their thermal environments in those nests, even if they don't have active sunlight exposure. Uh, so in the similar lines, we're talking about the forest, and this one's a question about wildfire. And um, this question is, I've seen bumblebee nests in the middle of a large wildfire burned area. I originally presumed that the nest went so deep it survived the fire. Now I'm wondering if it immediately colonized the burn area right after the fire, despite um, can bumblebees nest deep enough to avoid being burned? Great question. So I gave a little nod to the research being done in Oregon from Oregon State University in forested areas where they're looking at post wildfire, what bee populations do. And you hit, the, you hit it right on the nose that um, bees can definitely come in from adjacent areas and repopulate an area once it's been burned by wildfire. But in addition, some nest so deep under the ground that sometimes a wildfire does not penetrate and heat deeply enough through soil because it does require a high temperature to penetrate very deeply in the soil and some bee nests um, are very deep. With that being said, some are very shallow and they do get consumed in even a shallow fire, but a lot of bee nests are very deep and there's been research um, out there looking at what temperature um, can bees withstand depending upon the species and their type of nest that they create because their type of uh, nest structure is very uh, species specific as well. Um, so you could have a combination of both where the bees um, came back into the area right after wildfire. They often do that in the very first season after wildfire or that they made it through the wildfire because their nest was deep enough. Fascinating. Um, do you have, have you seen them nest in, another question I asked about like the hard compacted deadpan type soil, do you, have you seen them nesting in that uh, and have evidence of that? 
Yes, very frequently. And um, a lot of times where I see it personally is along embankments, along roadsides or in agricultural areas where you have this hard packed soil because you've had equipment going over the soil a lot. And then even on the side slope embankments, it just gets um, sun beaten and um, kind of packed down. And there isn't a root structure because not very many plants have, um, it's not hospitable to plants um, for their roots to kind of break in. So um, even those hard pan, hard pan um, embankments um, can be heavily populated by bees because they're not at risk of collapsing. And so they can burrow in and make a nest um, and it's a solid structure. So you will find that as well. That's actually a great habitat resource um, that you don't think about, that bees will use it even though we're not using it and it doesn't look like it's suitable for much. And someone asked too about um, like a drain fill near their home, or I think there's another question here too about a mix. Are there any certain pollinator mixes that you suggest for something like those open areas or those um, underused areas for people to use? Yeah, so pollinator mixes, um, long story short, there are a lot out there. And in fact, some years back, um, Cheerios, the cereal, used to include a pollinator mix in their box. But unfortunately, they distribute nationwide, um, perhaps worldwide. Um, and some of those species were invasive in some of the states that they distribute to. So they didn't really do their research. Their heart was in the right place, but you need to be very specific on what plant mix you are utilizing. You want it to be specific to your area um, because you don't want to be planting invasives. In addition, you want to make sure those plants germinate. You want to make sure that they can do well in your area. And so one problem we ran across recently working with um, Hampton Lumber, for example, which is an industrial forest owner that is doing great things when poll with pollinator enhancement um, in tandem with their timber harvest. Um, they have been planting different seed mixes that were promoted in Oregon, um, mainly for the Willamette Valley. But because they're just a little bit closer to the coast, some of these seed mixes didn't make it. And that could be because those specific requirements of some of those species in the seed mix were maybe better for um, a climate like in the valley that gets a bit more warmth, a bit less moisture than in the coast. So um, there aren't definitive species lists that I would point you to other than look at the resource it's coming from. So we're lucky to have the Xerces Society, which is an invertebrate conservation society. It's a nonprofit. They work nationwide, but they are based in Oregon, which lucky for us, and they do a lot of pollinator work. And they have great lists that they produce um, for Oregon. Um, NRCS also has regional lists for the nation. Now they don't break it out within states. So in Oregon, we have a lot of different type of ecosystems. And so um, you can't really just as I mentioned, use a, a species mix list that works for all of Oregon um, because it may not do well in Southwest Oregon as it does in Northeast Oregon, for example. Sure. Um, and a lot of these plant species mixes are not tested. So what I mean by that is we don't know how many bees they attract or if they attract that many at all. Sometimes they're added to the list just because they flower and they look like something a bee would visit. So um, they don't have data behind them. That's what we're actively trying to research. If you have no other place to start though, I would um, look at what is doing well in your immediate area, not just in your yard, but in your region of the state. Stand around, look at, look at where bees are flying, look at what they're visiting, um, target some of those plants. Beyond that, try one of these species mixes from the Xerces Society, NRCS. Um, also in that publication that I just produced, I listed a few that um, are great in forested areas, which observationally we've seen high the species visits, um, but that's a good place to start. Great suggestions. There was quite a few questions about plant mixes and where to go, so I think you covered all of those. Uh, Christine, we're going to take a minute, and if you want to share um, the next slide about where people can go for next week, just want to thank everybody for joining us today, and we'll continue answering questions, but uh, wanted to remind people if you're interested in next week, we have the Commercial Truffle Cultivation in Western Oregon uh, next Tuesday, July 7th. You can go to the website and register for that. Uh, and then I'm also going to launch our wrap-up poll where we are going to just ask about uh, how people 
um, felt about today's presentation. Hopefully, I know I gained a lot of great useful information. I'm sure others did too. So we'll let that go while you and I go back to some more questions. Um, so thanks for all that information and hope people can join us next week for um, webinars. And I also want to make sure I give a shout out to Ryan Gordon, who's helping in the chat box and helping uh, co-host today. I appreciate Ryan helping to answer some of those questions coming in as well. So while the wrap up poll is going, I appreciate people participating in that. Um, again, just a reminder that next week we have um, a couple, as I say, we're missing the afternoon one, but the uh, commercial truffle operation and then also goods from the woods, Dill Schroeder will be our afternoon talk. So um, if people want to go to the website, you can check out more and find those. So are you ready for some more questions? People just keep yeah. coming in. A great topic today. People are passionate about pollinators. Um, so there's some questions about honey. And uh, one person says, I don't think I heard, or heard you say much about honey or honey producers up to this point, um, since we're focusing more on the, on the forest. To what extent do the bee organizations you've worked with, part of the Oregon Bee Project and others, um, I think work uh, let's see, know to work with honey producers to support the honeybee populations. And even though they serve a mobile service that typically doesn't interact much with foresters. So I think just, uh, I think they're coming from the honey production side and maybe how you see that interact with what you've been doing. Yeah, so um, like I mentioned, the Oregon Bee Project does have a lot of advisory members that help steer us and give us guidance on what kind of questions we need to answer and things we need to tackle. And the Oregon Beekeeping Association is a part of that. Um, we have worked with them closely, especially when it comes to, for example, um, our vector control. So any sort of sprays being conducted for mosquitoes that could have a non-target impact on honeybees. So we want to make sure those two groups are communicating with each other. So for example, if a vector spray is going to take place, they're communicating with the adjacent beekeeping owners uh, to let them know to get their bees closed up so that they're protected or they work out a schedule for that. Um, so that's one of the avenues. Um, regarding forestry in particular, um, honeybees actually are used in forestry. So um, honeybees can, uh, the hives can be set out in forests. Um, there are permits for it for state forests and for federal forests so that they can feed on some of the plants. Um, for example, fireweed is really common for them to visit. So they might be put in areas where there's a lot of fireweed, which occurs naturally in our Oregon forests. Um, so that is very common. Um, and even if you don't intend them to reach the forest, honeybees can travel far and wide searching out food sources. So sometimes that means hopping over into an adjacent forest. There are plants that serve honeybees as well. Even though we bring them in for our crops, they are a generalist pollinator. So they visit a lot of different uh, flower varieties and that includes a lot of our natives and non-crops that can occur in forested systems. Interesting. Uh, amazing all the, all the things we need bees for. Yeah. So this person has some mason bee production and over 3,000 cocoons this year using the same mason bee cocoons. I had a poor crop of cocoons, maybe 10% of usual production. Any idea why? Um, the first thing that I would look at is parasites. So one of the things that um, I think some folks don't do is uh, cleaning their cocoons. For example, you can throw your cocoons in a little Tupperware container with sand and shake them about a little bit and that'll loosen a lot of the paras uh, parasites that might be external to the cocoons. But you may also have parasites inside the cocoon already. So if you see uh, holes or punctures that can be seen with the naked eye if you look close, um, in your cocoons, you may have already had a parasite that has laid an egg in that cocoon um, and is developing. So that could be the source. Um, they could also be carrying viruses um, that could be um, spread through different means. Um, it, it's really anybody's guess. It could be uh, a moisture issue that maybe they got a little too moist in their uh, nest. We always suggest that you should be cleaning out your nesting boxes and tubes and steer clear of the bamboo tubes. I know those are very popular, um, but the moisture conditions and the breathability within those is not as good as using some of the nesting blocks. Um, so we're not, unless you use the paper tube inside the bamboo tube. Um, 
So that could be, it could be a moisture quality control issue. Um, yeah, there are a wide variety of things that can attack these insects. So that just speaks to, they always need our help um, in trying to promote their habitat to the best of their liking because not all are gonna make it. Is there any idea of how far bees might travel from their nest? Yeah, so it really, as I gave a nod to earlier, it depends on size. So the larger bees, like bumblebees, um, they can travel pretty far. Some of the smaller bees, they tend to not travel more than, let's say, a few meters um, from their nesting area. Um, but bees can also be carried on the wind. Um, there, I think there was a study that showed a bee had traveled Oh, it was like 50 kilometers or something. Um, so that's many miles, um, but that's wind aided um, or some of the, the research is in a windmill in a lab. So that's not a natural environment. Um, it's kind of hard to track, but some can travel several miles depending upon the size. And um, if they, uh, they don't tend to uh, pick up and just uh, travel really far just to travel far. They're not gonna travel any further than they need to. All insects have very limited fat stores and they can't just hop off to the local Fred Meyer and um, power up and get the nutrients they need. They need to um, get as many nutrients in the shortest period of time. And so they don't wanna travel far if they don't know there's gonna be a pot of gold at the end of that rainbow. So they're not going to travel for miles unless they really need additional resources. Sometimes that can occur because there are a lot of bees in an area and they're out competing each other for those resources. So then they will step out and travel further. But the ability to travel far is usually dependent upon body size. The larger the bee, the further it travels. Interesting. You think of just how small they are and that ability to how far it goes. Um, could you maybe go to share a little bit, there's been some questions um, about, you know, how do we know kind of the when certain um, chemicals should actually just be banned over history versus being, um, you know, just something that we monitor or watch and maybe how does ODF and other organizations kind of walk that line of deciding when a chemical might just be too harmful or how, how is that decision made? Well, the first decision is made with the Oregon Department of Agriculture um, in our state. So um, we do have EPA looking into things um, very broadly across the nation, but um, Oregon Department of Agriculture is the regulating entity in our state for um, pesticide licensing. So determining if a pesticide can be used in our state and how it's used, and then if it's used improperly um, or the wrong pesticides are used, um, then they're the ones that handle those complaints. The Oregon Department of Forestry takes those rulings into account with our practices. Um, for example, there um, are different types of pesticides that maybe can be used in an agricultural environment, but not in a forested environment or vice versa. So we pay attention to those rules. We do not make those rules. We just follow those rules and um, help our landowner clients to follow those rules. Um, we do have a notification system so that if pesticide application is taking place, whether that's insecticide, herbicide, fungicide, et cetera, um, you are to submit a notification to us. If we do see something that looks a little off, we will connect with you about that um, and to follow up to find a different alternative. Um, we personally are not a research institution, so we do require assistance from places like Oregon State University that are doing testing on potential toxicity. Um, there is testing that's done by the manufacturers of pesticides, but obviously we want outside people to be doing that research um, rather than the ones that are trying to sell the product. So we do try to um, be up on the latest and greatest. There's always legislation coming through on trying to ban certain products. Um, Sometimes it feels as though we would want to ban a lot of these products or maybe ban a whole group of products, but we need to realize that some of them are used for very specific instances, such as invasive plants that are otherwise also very damaging, um, even to insects such as bees. When you have invasive plants such as blackberry or scotch broom coming in, you markedly and, and quickly uh, reduce the native plants that are able to provide forage for bees. Even though bees can visit invasives, they, um, they want more than one food source. And so um, recognizing that pesticides do have their place for 
um, certain objectives. It's very important. So to broadly ban something may be dangerous as well. But we, um, we are committed to obviously following whatever rules are set forth by Oregon Department of Agriculture, making sure we answer questions for people on if you are going to uh, utilize pesticides, how best to use them um, to avoid toxicity with bees and um, providing any sort of guidance and answering questions that um, is required. Great. And I think that's where you really talked about the importance of the education, especially, you know, someone asked about what about those things that are sold to commercial or non-commercial, like, um, you know, without permitting, like at the box stores and hardware stores and those type, anything uh, for like those type of consumers that you want to remind people about? Yeah. So especially at the box stores, you know, it's really easy um, for, you know, the homeowner or small property owner to have a pest issue go into the box store and look for somebody that can help them find the right product. It's very confusing and complicated um, to find the right products. And sometimes there's some labeling that's not really clear on what pests they're really targeting. And so you may think that um, one size fits all when that's just not simply the case. Additionally, it is uh, very easy um, to think that a little bit of a product works so well that a, a bit more is going to work even better when that's usually not the case. Um, those application, um, the application guidance on dosage is very important because if you apply too much, not only could you have non-target effects, but you could possibly have a resistance pop up in the pest you're trying to treat for. And so maybe the next year you can't use that same product again because there's a resistance to it. So um, it's really important to uh, be aware of your resources, such as utilizing even extension services like um, the Master Gardeners for product selection. They may have some better alternatives for you, especially in the gardening system and just your backyard garden. Um, at the big box stores, they often do not have um, personnel that are um, knowledgeable about this. So doing your research by reading the label, really focusing on what pests does this work for? Um, and then even doing some searches online. Now I say that, but be careful because there's a lot out there that's not factual. Um, but if you see a lot of the same type of information from a respected source, such as a research institution, a university, especially if it's local. If you have something from OSU, you can feel a bit more confident that they've done their job um, to find that information, but the onus is on you in applying these products. Um, a lot of the products are a little bit weaker that are available to the general public without a license, but that's not to say that they cannot be very damaging, especially if they're applied in the wrong situation or at the wrong dosage. So be very clear on when you're applying the products, on what type of crop and what pests you are trying to focus on. Good suggestions. And I think that information on the app is really useful that you had shared about. Um, I think that's a valuable resource. Yeah. So uh, moving a little bit back to the bees and uh, someone mentioned that they had a horn faced mason bee nesting in their mason bees house this year. Since this is not a native bee, are there bad pollinators? So are there non-native pollinators that compete with the native? Yeah, so there are non-native pollinators. There are non-native bees that we are aware of. Um, they, on, on the larger scale, they probably aren't going to outcompete our bees to a point where they will exterminate some of our natives, but anything could happen. But yes, we do have some non-natives. Um, there's one that the name is, um, it's the wool carter bee. Um, that's actually a, a pretty little bee. It's very fuzzy. Um, but it's a European wool carter bee that it not only will it outcompete, but it physically will um, bully our native bees. They, the males will tend to hang by a plant and hover, and then any other bee that comes to feed on that plant, they'll physically push them away. So you'll see kind of a headbutting thing going on in midair. It's, it's kind of a sight to behold. It looks kind of neat. But typically that native bee will try a couple times and then just go to the next plant. They'll try something else. So there is competition, but realize there's also competition between our native bees that are looking for the same resource. Sometimes that's beneficial because it can increase the productivity of one pollinator for another. Um, there is research that has shown that if we introduce some uh, native bees into systems where um, we have honeybees, such as almond orchards, the productivity of pollination 
goes way up because those honeybees are trying to get to the um, plants faster than those native bees. So their competition can be good in some cases, um, but obviously um, you, if you are going to populate your yard with bees, if you're buying them at a garden store, try and find natives if you can. Um, but we do, yes, we do have some non-natives out there. There isn't a whole lot of research as to which ones we have and where they occur, but that is ongoing. Good. So um, also kind of going back to the forest, there was uh, been a couple questions about some of the research, which you covered a lot of that. Uh, I think just one of the questions someone had um, kind of was an interesting for those uh, bees that are in the ground. We talked about in the clear cuts. Sometimes there can be really big temperature swings in those. You know, we've all been out there where uh, one time you're freezing and maybe even later that day it's, it's very hot. So um, would the temperature swing be difficult for bees? Yes, it could be. Um, it depends on how exposed they are. Um, if they are below ground, the temperature swings um, are uh, mitigated a little bit because temperature travels more slowly in soil systems. Um, some bees also practice what's called shivering. You may have seen it early in the morning when it's a little cooler. Um, bumblebees are a common one that does this, um, where they basically will vibrate their body very quickly and that generates a heat. Um, if they have a hive, for example, they can generate pretty high temperatures doing that, but also individuals can do that as well. So they can combat that. Also, um, one huge advantage that winged insects have is that they can simply move to another area. So um, they, they will obviously try and nest in an area that they find most suitable um, in, in terms of temperature, moisture conditions, et cetera. Um, so they can't easily pick up a nest, so they'll try and get that down. But if they're just feeding, if it's a cool area, they might try to hunker down and wait for it to pass, or they might move to another area before it gets too cold to fly. That's um, great information. And I know you've done a lot of research and spent a lot of time out there. Any last um, observations from any of your research that you'd like to share? I think we're about wrapped up with questions. I really appreciate all your time today. So um, thanks for all the useful information and spending time answering questions. I'll let you have any last words that you might want to share with anybody. Sure. So um, as I mentioned, this is these are pretty new developments and we really started hitting the ground in 2015. So um, some years have passed, but it does take time for these research projects to get developed. Um, there are some that are still in progress. Um, and I cannot release any uh, cutting edge information until it's published, um, but we are lucky that we have folks at OSU and I'll give a nod to Jim Rivers, who does a lot of work through OSU on pollinators in the forest environment. Um, but luckily we are all communicating with each other and whenever there's new research results we can share, we share that with each other and we share it with the public. And so looking at the, um, the sources of producing this um, information from research, such as the Oregon Bee Project website, that's how you can stay up to date on all the new progress that's been made that's distilled in a way that's interesting to the public to read and absorb um, rather than having to go through uh, reading journals or more dry material. Um, you can get the straight information right there. Great. Well, thank you for all that you've been doing and your research, really fascinating, all the information. And we'll mention too, uh, in the chat, we did put your email. So if people have other questions that have come up or um, have specific questions about some of that research we didn't get to today, you can contact Christine and she loves talking bees. Uh, so anytime you want to send that to her. So again, thank you for your time and your expertise. And thanks to everyone for joining us today. Just a reminder, um, today was recorded, so if you'd like to go and take a look at uh, this webinar another time or go to those resources, there's a lot of great information and that um, has been posted in the chat as well. Just go back to the Tree School online pages. So thank you again for everyone for joining us and Christine, thanks again for your time and to Ryan for helping uh, things behind the scenes. So everybody have a great evening. Wonderful, thank you so much, Julie. Thank you.